This week on WealthTrack, applying the lessons of history to make you a better investor. Ultimately, power is a function of financial leadership. If you are not at the cutting edge of finance, if your financial technology is lagging behind, ultimately you will recede as the world's leading power. And I don't think that lesson has fully been absorbed uh, at the Treasury or at the Fed. Part two of our wide-ranging interview with renowned historian Neil Ferguson is new this week on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. What does history have to teach us about the current geopolitical, economic, and investment environment? A great deal, according to renowned historian Neil Ferguson. In case you are not familiar with Ferguson, here's how frequent Wealth Track guest and noted financial historian himself, Richard Silla, describes his former colleague. Neil is one of the great financial historians of our time, which is how I met him a quarter century ago. Since then, he has also become one of the greatest general historians of our time, with sterling contributions to the history of wars, empires, institutional and civilization decay, the power of networks, and now pandemics and other catastrophes. Ferguson is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. He is also the author of 16 books, many of them bestsellers, among them The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World, now in its 10th edition, which he also produced as an award-winning PBS series. Two years ago, he published The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook, which he also turned into a PBS series, Neil Ferguson's Net World. And his most recent book is Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, which analyzes how societies have reacted to crises over the centuries including modern government's handling of COVID-19. A decade ago, he branched out into the investment arena as founder and managing director of Green Mantle, an advisory firm offering historical perspective and research services to a select group of clients, including many top hedge fund and investment firms. His thesis is that applying the lessons of history to contemporary events can result in better investment outcomes. And one of the biggest, most consequential debates among economists, investors, and policymakers now is over inflation. Is the recent global surge in prices a temporary blip from economies reopening from pandemic shutdowns, or is it a more lasting development with serious consequences? That was one of the questions I put to Ferguson in the first of our wide-ranging two-part interview. Alan Meltzer wrote this great history of the Fed, the late, great Alan Meltzer. If Alan were here today, he'd be saying they're making the same mistakes they made in the 60s, but on a much larger scale. Because remember, the deficits and the balance sheet expansion of the late 60s is much, much less. They're both much less than we've seen uh, in, in, the past, uh, in the past year. So I think there's a significant chance uh, that you're going to get a rerun of that 1960s shift in inflation expectations. And there's another historical analogy there that I think is important and worth thinking about. We talk all the time about green infrastructure, green new deals. Europe, America, most countries have bold ambitions to be carbon neutral at some stage in the coming decades. That is not a free lunch, contrary to what some people are claiming. I think that will impose significant costs when you actually work out what it means to transition away from things like shale gas to transition to so-called renewables. And I could conceive of ways in which it actually uh, could reinforce that existing inflation impulse. Today we pick up on that point. I asked Ferguson about the opposite view, that the pandemic shock and burden of record amounts of debt and costs associated with transitioning to clean energy could actually impede growth and be disinflationary. I'll put it somewhat differently. It seems to me that when you look at household balance sheets uh, coming out of, uh, of 2020, they're in, in a completely different state from the way they were after the financial crisis. People right, have a much lot better. of dry powder, massively right. better. People have a ton of money to spend because they couldn't spend last year. And the government was also stuffing checks into, into people's uh, mailboxes. So I, I think there's a huge amount of spending power in, in the north of a trillion. Uh, we don't know quite how quickly it will be unleashed, but the evidence certainly points to a pretty rapid recovery of spending in all those sectors that the pandemic uh, shut down. So that, that would be point one. Point two, the big unknown is this labor market of ours, which has been greatly distorted by mm -hmm. generous unemployment uh, uh, payments, uh, greatly distorted by the fear of some older workers about returning to work, greatly distorted in all kinds of ways. 
We just don't know if there's going to be a return to participation of people who've left the workforce or whether that really large number of people, up to 3 million, who are kind of not really looking for work, have checked out permanently. And so I think, you know, look closely at the data to see whether the labor market is healing. If it doesn't fully heal and if there has been a significant and maybe lasting reduction in participation, then I think you will see wage pressures. They're already visible. Let me ask you about a, another uh, big issue that I know is, is on your agenda to discuss with clients at Greenmantle, and that's China. And it's something you and I have discussed uh, on a number of occasions. And looking at you know, the list of the books that you've written, you know, Empire, Civilization, uh, certainly most recently, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. So you've been thinking about this a lot. Um, so China, why is that such uh, an important uh, point on, on your agenda? Well, I think from the vantage point of Wall Street, uh, there is a bit of a conundrum here. The rest of the world appears to be moving uh, towards Cold War II, uh, the American public, uh, the, the new administration, many European governments, the Indian government. Generally, there is agreement. Uh, not only that China acted badly in its initial handling of the pandemic, but that China poses some pretty fundamental threats uh, right. uh, to democracy. That China, under Xi Jinping, is a more clearly ideological power, that it aspires to at least parity, if not primacy, in the Indo-Pacific region, that its attitude towards democracy is, to put it, mildly hostile, uh, and that its conduct, whether it's in Hong Kong or in its own uh, backyard in Xinjiang, uh, is, uh, is not something that we in the West can be comfortable with. Uh, and those views are, are no longer confined to hawks in the Republican Party. Uh, even if Donald Trump started this ball rolling with his attacks on China in his campaign back in 2015-16, it's become bipartisan. Except right. Wall Street didn't get the memo. Because despite all of this, we see increased flows uh, into China uh, from US financial institutions. We see more participation in, in joint ventures and uh, other enterprises in China, great flows into bonds, lots of interest in China tech. And my question is, uh, what are you going to do if, if you're wrong and the Cold War II thesis is right, and we have decoupling or escalation in the US-China uh, confrontation over, let's say, Taiwan? Let me give you a scenario, uh, Consuelo. After the Winter Olympics uh, in Sochi back in 2014, not long, uh, later, uh, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea. Now, what if after the Beijing Winter Olympics next year, uh, Xi Jinping decides uh, to grab Taiwan? Uh, this is not a non-trivial uh, probability. Uh, it is his stated ambition to bring Taiwan fully back under the control uh, of the Chinese Communist Party and the Beijing government. As the he's US doing with Hong Kong. Right. And, and in many ways, it's a bigger deal, Consuelo, because yes. Taiwan is functionally an independent country. Functionally, right. it has its own democracy. It's not in as weak a position as Hong Kong. And mm -hmm. moreover, we have a 1979 obligation uh, to support Taiwan and prevent a violent end uh, to its current somewhat ambiguous status. The Chinese say it's part of China. Everybody else knows it's not. Uh, and if that is to be overturned uh, by military action, I don't really see how the United States can just do nothing. Uh, and so there's a scenario which I think is very plausible in the minds of military planners, that we have a showdown, maybe not full-blown invasion, but maybe blockade or maybe just quarantine, but at least something that challenges the status quo with respect to Taiwan. And I think investors are not paying enough attention to this, nor are they really listening to those who say, if that happens, we're talking about potentially a very big war. We, we got used to small wars. I mean, right. Iraq, Afghanistan, in the great scheme of things, were very small conflicts. A US-China war would be big. And it would not just be a war confined uh, to boats in the uh, Taiwan Strait. It would for almost certainly be a, a war with a cyber com component to it. And one of the things that I think we probably don't worry enough about, and I argue this in, in doom, is what a full-blown cyber attack on the United States looks like if it takes out really big parts of our infrastructure. That's the war of the future, and I, I don't know that we are fully prepped for that. And we're certainly not thinking about that in Wall Street, are we? 
what do we do as investors again? When do you start to become defensive? When do you start to withdraw investments from China? What are, what are the practical steps that you think we should be considering taking? Well, I think here you need to kind of build some scenarios uh, because there's a scenario in which, in fact, uh, relations go from uh, confrontation to detente much more quickly than they did in the first Cold War. And I, I could imagine that. Uh, I sense that what the Biden administration has set out to do is to talk tough and show that it means business, but in the hope of getting to more meaningful negotiations on, on, on the issues that, that they think both sides care about, climate change being the one that usually gets mentioned. So there may be a plan in Washington to go from tough talk of the sort that we saw from uh, Tony Blinken uh, in Anchorage to something more like detente. I mean, imagine a, a Cold War that goes straight to the 1970s without really taking in the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's possible. Uh, and it may also be that the Chinese take a long, hard look at their military options and say, this is way too risky. So I think investors shouldn't just bail from China, right. uh, because that would be, I think, a too simple a reading. But I think you have to make sure that you have an exit strategy. And that's where it's tricky. Because China still has capital controls, it is not an easy thing uh, to liquidate your positions in China in a hurry if things mm -hmm. get ugly. Uh, and I think that's where investors need to be very, very careful indeed. Yeah, by all means, you can have exposure to China. This is an economy that has grown strongly uh, in, in recent uh, months. Uh, but do you have an exit strategy? What do you do if things turn sour? Uh, and I look at all the different moving parts here. Uh, not just the financial, but looking at the technological, looking at the military components, looking at the fact that rather surprisingly, the Biden administration has continued most of the Trump administration's policy on China. And I say this certainly still has the potential, even if it's only a 20% probability scenario, of getting nasty fast. And if you don't have an exit strategy, then you could find yourself suffering some very heavy losses indeed. And another area that you've expressed concern about um, in your research and columns uh, is China's role in, in digital currencies and the fact that you're warning the administration that, that we need to pay attention and we need to invest more ourselves in digital currencies. Can you explain what your concern is there? Well, I don't think we should just be copying and pasting. I mean, the Chinese have rolled out rather hurriedly a central bank digital currency. And, and I hear people say, well, why don't we have one? And I don't really blame Jay Powell at the Fed when he says I'm, I'm, I'm in no rush to do this, because it's not immediately clear to me that we need something like uh, the central bank digital currency. Uh -huh. I think the main motivation that, that propelled the government in Beijing to, to rush this was the belief, uh, which was domestically focused, that the big tech companies in China were getting too powerful financially. Uh, that was one reason why the Ant Group IPO got pulled. It's why Jack Ma has been politically humbled. We often forget that China's biggest preoccupation is China. And so part of what is going on with the central bank digital currency is a concerted effort by the Chinese Communist Party to make sure that Alibaba and Tencent don't take over the entire Chinese domestic financial system. So I think it's important to get that in, in perspective. But then, then look at the US approach to financial innovation. We have a lot of financial innovation going on here. We talked a little bit earlier about cryptocurrency and uh, decentralized finance, which is the latest uh, cool thing in town. But the authorities in Washington are very committed to a legacy financial system that I, I would call the, the fiat system we inherited from the 1970s. It's a, it's a system uh, in which interbank international payments are done by SWIFT. That's been around a long time. Consumers use credit cards. They've been around a long time. And we still do stuff like writing checks and waiting days for the payments to clear. Right. Our system looks quite antiquated, but the authorities are very attached to it. Why? Because the United States has a superpower thanks to this system. It can impose financial sanctions on anyone it likes. And we discovered that superpower only after 9-11. So no wonder the Fed and the Treasury like things the way they are. Why would we change things? That's the thing that I hear very often in Washington. And my response is, things are changing whether you like it or not. Uh, you've got not only central bank digital currencies in China, but you've got this rapidly exploding crypto space, decentralized finance. And you can't just sit there and say, can it please stay the 1970s? Because we, 
we, we like the way this works. The world is moving on. People expect faster payments. They are ready to experiment uh, with, with digital assets. Uh, people want to make payments with their phones. The check is going the way slowly but surely of the banknote. So I think the United States needs a strategy for 21st century payments, 21st century money, and it doesn't really have one at the moment. And that worries me because in, in the ascent of money, and it's a point I repeat again in Doom, ultimately power is a function of financial leadership. If you are not at the cutting edge of finance, if your financial technology is lagging behind, ultimately you will recede as the world's leading power. And I don't think that lesson has fully been absorbed uh, at the Treasury or at the Fed. And decentralized finance, it's an area that you're investing in at Green Mantle, talking about financial innovation, that's the, kind of the cutting edge. What should we know about decentralized finance, um, Neil, as, as investors, so that, you know, that we, can, we can start researching it uh, on our own and figuring out how we participate? Well, as I said, this is a kind of uh, Cambrian explosion of financial innovation, all kinds of different things, some of them crazy, like Dogecoin, things that are are jokes that only really take off because Elon Musk tweets about them and a bunch of retail investors go, yay. Uh, yes. This is the kind of stuff you'd expect in an atmosphere of basically zero rates and infinite liquidity. This makes it especially hard to sort through the nonsense and try and establish what out there has a meaningful use case, what is actually going to be uh, useful beyond merely for speculation. Stable coins are a really interesting case here where there's been a whole series of attempts to come up with something that uh, you know, is a dollar but, but, but is backed by fiat and acts like, like crypto. I, I'm really skeptical about that mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a way forward. Ultimately, if you're, if you're uh, backing a bunch of crypto uh, tokens with, with fiat, with dollars, you're a bank. And at some point, you're going to get regulated like a bank. So I'm skeptical of, of uh, stable coins. So I'm kind of looking at other things that seem to me to offer better uh, and more interesting prospects to an investor. There have certainly been a whole bunch of things that have outperformed Bitcoin. If that was what you wanted to do, you, you didn't mm -hmm. want to be just long Bitcoin. You'd have missed out on a lot of action in the past year. And uh, so one has to, I think, take a, a view that there are a bunch of ideas out there to try to provide at new kinds of, of digital asset to try to provide new forms of, of payment. Much of it is experimental. And my advice is read the white paper. Uh, and that's my approach. Let's see what is this project? What is, what is it they're saying they're going to do? And does it actually have substance? Because I don't think there's any point in, uh, in buying Dogecoin any more than you should, be, uh, you should be long some of the stocks that have been behaving crazily, unless it, it's your desire to, to, to make and then lose a lot of money, uh, as, as assuredly uh, some people will. And Neil, uh, doom the politics of catastrophe. Can you explain uh, the, the, the thesis of doom the politics of catastrophe to us? Well, investors need to be ready for disasters because disasters will happen. The argument of doom, which is a general history of disaster, is that because we can't predict disasters, it matters a lot how quickly we respond to them. One reason that COVID became such a disaster in 2020 was that we responded very slowly to the initial danger signs and actually took very little action until mid-March, by which time it was too late and most Western countries had the virus pretty much everywhere. So mm -hmm. what, what I argue in the book is that, that the things we sometimes call natural disasters aren't natural at all. They might have their point of origin in a new virus or a crop failure, but it takes human agency to turn that into large-scale uh, uh, elevated mortality. Uh, and I think that if one, one asks the question, what really explains why the United States had more than half a million deaths from COVID and Taiwan has only recently passed the 100 mark, the answer is not that the virus was different in Taiwan or that the biology of the Taiwanese population is different from the American. It's that the political responses were completely different. The Taiwanese were really quick on the draw. They knew how to do testing and contact tracing quickly and they effectively enforced the isolation of infected individuals. And we did none of that. So we are going to confront new disasters uh, for sure in the coming years. And nobody knows which one will be next. 
That's the nature of the historical process. All we can try and do is make sure that as investors, uh, we have at least some protection from these uh, uncertain uh, risks to which we can't attach probabilities. Uh, whether it's a cyber attack or that earthquake in California that we know will one day strike, uh, the, the, the key, it seems to me, is to make sure not only that you have a plan for your own safety if you live in California, uh, but that you actually have some financial planning too. Uh, these things are going to happen at some point over the coming decades. Uh, the, the same applies, especially truly, if uh, the pessimists are right about climate change. And, and that's why I think uh, we need to be changing our approach uh, to disaster management in the realm of public policy, but also in the realm of investment. Mm -hmm. And in the realm of investment, you're just saying financial planning in general or actually having you know, very defensive uh, assets in your portfolios. I mean, gold certainly is considered to be a, a hedge against disaster. That, those kind of things in, in a diversified portfolio. I think it's important to look at the insurance industry, actually, because if you think about a disaster prone world, which might be becoming more prone to disaster because not only of climate change, but because of technology. Remember, we've created a whole bunch of new ways for things to go disastrously wrong. Uh, nuclear technology was the, the first phase of this. Uh, but I think with the, the uh, emergence of the internet, uh, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology and genetic engineering, we're really creating a lot of different ways in which disaster can strike. And our insurance industry is running, struggling to keep up with this changing landscape. I think that's particularly true in cyber. Uh, so my strong suggestion is that we and you think about uh, how you are insured and whether your insurer is one of those that is up to speed with the new world of risk, the new world of disaster that we're in in the 21st century. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have all of us own some of in a diversified portfolio? Yeah, I would be looking to try and get uh, exposure to decentralized finance, not, not just to Bitcoin, but, but looking to try uh, to find the few products that are now out there that, that are offering you some kind uh, of, of, of selective portfolio. There, there are institutions, uh, Blocktar is a is a hedge fund I advise that that is really uh, trying to produce the kind of diversification and the expertise that it's hard to accumulate so that you're not just long Bitcoin you actually have exposure to a bunch of, of serious crypto assets and that seems to me like a very interesting uh, way to go there's a lot of uh, innovation going on uh, in this space uh, new companies are coming along. Uh, new uh, financial products are being created to allow people who don't have the time to read all the white papers uh, to get exposure to, to some serious uh, projects rather than to be uh, speculatively buying Dogecoins. At one point, you were recommending uh, some investments in Bitcoin or a, a cryptocurrency, some uh, a small percentage of one's portfolio. Can, can you tell me about, um, about that recommendation? Well, I think given the volatility, uh, which isn't as high as it was in the uh, early years of Bitcoin's existence, but it's still, uh, it's still tough. I mean, you've got to have the nerves of a commodity investor to take this kind of uh, volatility. And sometimes it's even more volatile than commodities. I think under those circumstances, you've got to make sure that you don't increase your exposure uh, too much to this new rapidly evolving uh, scene. I said in the ascent of money that, that the millionaires will soon have 1% of their portfolios in this kind of uh, space. And, and the, the more adventurous will, will go higher than that because you can see the sophisticated investors licking their lips and saying, you know what, this reminds me of the early days of hedge funds. But I think to your, uh, your regular investor who, who wants to have some exposure to the upside but not be destroyed uh, in a big drawdown, 1% still feels about right to me. And my, my sense was when, when I looked at my own portfolio and it had got a lot more than that just because of rapid appreciation, I was like, mm, probably time to, to rebalance this guy. Neil Ferguson, always a treat to have you on Wealthtrack. Thanks, Consuelo. At the close of every Wealthtrack, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is one for your summer reading list. Neil Ferguson's The Square on the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook. 
Ferguson argues that networks are not a 21st century innovation. They have been with us from the beginning. Hierarchies and high towers have claimed to rule, but power is often resided in the networks in the town square below. An Amazon pick for best history when the book was published in 2018, the Wall Street Journal wrote, Neil Ferguson has again written a brilliant book. In 400 pages, you will have restocked your mind. Basically, by reading any of Ferguson's 16 books, you will be expanding your knowledge of the way the world and humans have operated throughout history. The fact that he is applying his prodigious grasp of history to help us become better investors is a major benefit. Well, next week, Buffett student and collaborator Lawrence Cunningham discusses his perennial bestseller, The Essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America, his multi-year project with one of the greatest investors of all time. For those of you active on social media, we invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. We truly appreciate the time you spend with us and our guests. Have a lovely weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one. Funding provided by Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, ClearBridge Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, First Eagle Investment Management, and Strategus Asset Management.